given the nature of that which has already occurred, there is much that will be ultimately reported um, and recorded in the booklet that I understand will be published of all of the papers that I will not deal with uh, today. Um, you have already heard from the first session uh, some of the involvement of Australia in Holocaust denial and indeed one of the issues which I share with my German colleague just finished is our joint ownership of um, the infamous Frederick Tobin. And one of the cases in which I was involved and to which Jonathan referred um, was indeed a case involving uh, Frederick Tobin to which I will come. I start, if I might, and I will depart almost entirely from the prepared paper because I will rely as much on my role in the leadership of the Jewish community in the past and continuing as I do on my position as a judge. Uh, I hasten to add that what I'm about to say is not necessarily the view of the Supreme Court or all of its judges, nor indeed of the Jewish community and all of its members. Nevertheless, um, uh, it's important to understand some of the things that have occurred in Australia and the lessons that all of us, and particularly in Australia, have learned from, um, from those issues. Can I deal with a number of things somewhat eclectically, and I apologise if any of you don't understand my Australian accent, but, um, <laughs> but um, uh, can I deal with some of the things eclectically and then uh, uh, bring them back uh, to a couple of points? The first is um, perhaps to give you a very brief and short background of the Jewish community. The Jewish community in Australia numbers about 120,000, um, between 120 and 140,000. It's one of the few Jewish communities, I think the only Jewish community in the diaspora that is growing by natural uh, means, that is uh, by birth rate, um, although it's growing very slowly. Um, the Jewish community in Australia is unusual, if not totally unique, in that it can date to the exact day when the first Jew was in Australia. And there were 16 uh, members of the Jewish community on the first fleet of convicts um, on the 26th of January 1788. There were 320 convicts and 16 Jews. And the Jewish community, as a consequence of that, has always had in Australia um, an extremely close relationship with um, the Catholic Church, who, whose members uh, particularly made up um, a large number of the political prisoners that were exported or transported from England to Australia after the uh, American War of Independence. So, um, uh, as, as stated, that relationship with the Catholic Church pervades some of the factors that go to the Australian democracy, and I'll come to that shortly. What occurred in Australia due to, amongst other things, the significance of the Jewish community amongst the European settlers in the early days and, and the benevolence of some of the early governors of New South Wales was that there was firstly an emancipation of convicts and secondly, a initially blind eye turning, if, uh, I don't know if that's an Australian colloquialism, but um, uh, certainly um, um, a tolerance of, if not um, rendering lawful, um, religious services other than the Anglican Church's religious services, even before that occurred in the United Kingdom. So there were, there were Catholic Church's services as early as the 1790s in, uh, in um, Australia, and there were Jewish services as early as 1789 in Australia. And um, the consequence of that and the recognition of St. Patrick's Day as a, as a uh, public holiday in Australia and, and the like, all of which came about by the... By the um, cooperative action of the Roman Catholic members and uh, Jewish members brought about a relationship which has continued. Now, I, I emphasise that for a number of reasons, um, one of which is by coincidence that um, we say it's not a matter of simple coincidence that the Archbishop, of draw that, the Cardinal who was in charge of drafting the Nostra Aetate for the Catholic Church was in fact an Australian Cardinal of Irish background. The... Um, if I can then move forward 90 years, New South Wales appointed a Chief Justice that was Jewish. Um, by that stage, New South Wales was confined to a particular state instead of the whole of Australia as it was originally. 
That Chief Justice lasted two weeks. He lasted two weeks predominantly because of the level of anti-Semitism and the reaction to his appointment. The level of anti-Semitism and the reaction um, meant a number of things. The first of them is that the Jewish community in the late 1900s, certainly the establishment members of the Jewish community in the late 1800s and early 1900s, became more British than the British. I'd make no um, <coughs> disparaging remarks about uh, the, the facilitator, but um, <coughs> we had in 1930s a Jewish Chief Justice who became indeed the first Australian-born Governor General. His name was Sir Isaac Isaacs. But he was, in some senses, representative of many establishment Jews. I exclude from that people like my own grandparents and parents who were, who were recent arrivals in the 1920s. Um, uh, but they decided that they were firstly, like the British, against the partition of the British mandate and against the establishment of the State of Israel, and they were against the immigration of, quote, foreign Jews, end quote. Um, it is that attitude, and indeed an attitude that was reflected in the Australian government of the time, that in 1938 let the Australian government somewhat infamously to say at the EVN conference, we do not have a racial problem and we do not want to import one. I make this preliminary comment for this reason. We are here in Berlin. Uh, I was, and as was my wife, who is a survivor or a descendant of survivors, uh, diffident about being in Berlin and having a conference of Jewish lawyers. I was diffident because we look at Berlin as the pinnacle of that which is horrific in our past. At the same time, we have to realise that in 1938, whether it could have come about or not is a different question, but in 1938 at the EVN conference, the world had an opportunity to do something about the Jews of Germany. And the world, as a group, failed. And we, as a community, failed because we put insufficient pressure on our own governments to ensure that they were willing to take in Jews from Europe. And that is an issue that affects not only Germany and not only Berlin, it affects Australia, it affects the United States, it affects every member of the Western, so-called Western civilization. Um, if, I can, um, if I can move on um, somewhat from um, 1938 and tell you that um, as a development of the relationship between what I'll call non-establishment working uh, Jewish members of, the, members of the Jewish community and, and the Catholic Church and its influence on some of the political forces in Australia, what occurred in 1941 with the change in government was the election of a government that was particularly pro-Jewish. Uh, it was particularly pro-Jewish mainly because of that, the influence of the Catholic Church on what was then the Australian Labor Party, uh, and still is the Australian Labor Party. Um, the effect of that was manifest and significant from the Jewish community's point of view. What occurred was um, a member of the High Court, Dr. Evatt, retired from the High Court, went into the government because of the emergency situation of the war and um, became foreign minister. He later became the president of the United Nations General Assembly and the chair of the uh, Committee on Partition. Uh, it was Dr. Evatt who marshaled the numbers on the committee and ultimately on the United Nations for the vote. Uh, I will come back to the issue of the Shoah and its relationship to the existence of the State of Israel in a moment, but, um, but um, after the war, notwithstanding Australia's um, admittedly racist white Australia policy in terms of immigration, steps were taken to subvert or overturn that policy to ensure that um, as many um, refugees from Europe could be admitted into Australia as possible. The effect of what that was that there were a huge number, in relative to Australian population, a huge number of, um, of Jewish um, 
immigrants into Australia in the uh, late half of the 1940s, but because of the lack of uh, real testing of the situation, there were also um, immigrants who we ultimately found out were war criminals. Um, that's a matter of some regret, but nevertheless, um, those, that is the historical background, and I apologise for taking as long as I have on that issue, but it's important to understand the context in which we as Jews in Australia approach this problem. As a consequence of all of that, the Jewish community in Australia uh, has the highest proportion of Holocaust survivors and descendants of any country in the diaspora. And Holocaust denial is a particularly uh, problematic issue in, in, um, in the Jewish community and in Australia, exacerbated by the fact that we have war criminals and descendants of war criminals who continue to um, uh, promulgate the kind of material which, of which you have heard. I don't intend to go through um, each of the, or the kind of material that was propagated, but because most of you have heard it from uh, Eliha Cohen, you would have heard from, indeed, some of the pictures that you saw were out of the Adelaide Institute about which the previous speaker um, uh, told you. And um, much of it um, was put on the web by uh, Frederick Tobin. I then, if I might, come to a quite different issue, and that is the issue of the Australian Constitution and freedom of speech. The Australian Constitution is infected just to a major degree by um, the United States Constitution. Given that Australia was federated um, as an independent country in 1901 and has a written constitution, for obvious reasons, the United States Constitution was a model on which um, the framers of the Constitution operated. The American Constitution has therefore a lot to answer for. Uh, both as to what the Australian Constitution contains and what it does not contain. It does not contain a Bill or Charter of Rights. So unlike Europe, unlike the United States and Canada, we do not have a Bill of Rights or a Charter of Rights. Nevertheless, our Constitutional Court, our Federal Supreme Court, called the High Court of Australia, has in fact... Um, excuse me for one moment. Technology has got the better of me. Um, our, our federal Supreme Court has implied certain guarantees into the Australian Constitution, and one of them is the guarantee of political communication and the freedom of political communication. As a consequence, the, um, the High Court has uh, made clear that um, in terms of the rights of people to participate in a responsible government, and I'll quote, if I can, from Chief Justice Mason in 1992, where he said, freedom of communication is so indispensable to the efficacy of the system of representative government for which the Constitution makes provision that it is necessarily implied in the making of that provision. So that notwithstanding that we have no Bill of Rights, we um, do not allow restraint on political communication. But the restraint that is uh, 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 prohibited um, is a restraint which does more than protect rational argument and peaceful conduct. Because the High Court has reasoned that the history of um, invective and the history of emotion in political debate in Australia and indeed in Western civilization, is so entrenched that to allow a law that prohibited irrational argument or appeal to emotion would be a law that interfered with democracy and therefore would be invalid. Notwithstanding that, we have two quite distinct frames. No freedom of speech is absolute, not even under the First Amendment of the United States is freedom of speech. Absolute. You can't, you can't um, um, run into a picture theatre is the typical example. Run into a picture theatre and call fire. Um, that freedom of speech doesn't protect that proposition, nor does it 
um, protect um, invocations to violence and the like. So the question really is not whether freedom of speech uh, is a bar to um, a law, but where one draws the line as to where freedom of speech interferes with um, the rights of minorities, in particular in this relevant situation. And um, with great respect to the previous speaker, it is not a question of whether or not there is an advertisement for lingerie and whether that is morally reprehensible, because we are not here talking simply about moral reprehensibility. What we are talking about is weighing, on the one hand, what is necessary for dem democracy. And in Australia, we have the two quite distinct but necessarily related um, avenues. The first of them is freedom of political communication, and the second is what Aristotle referred to as formal equality, that is, equal justice before the law. And the only time equal justice can be um, not applied, and I use that term um, um, reservedly, um, is where there is a rational reason for the inapplicability of e equality. That is, in other words, in the Aristotelian sense, and as the High Court just explained in, in uh, uh, a famous case in Australia called Postiglione, when it comes to sentencing, all people before the law must be treated equally, and they are treated unequally only to the extent of their inequality. The, the, um, and it is, those, it is those aspects which then uh, combine when one comes to issues such as racial vilification and Holocaust denial. Now, <clears throat> if I can come back um, uh, fairly quickly to the reality of Holocaust denial in Australia. We do not have a law that prohibits Holocaust denial in Australia. We do have a law, which is the Racial Discrimination Act, which includes provisions which um, render unlawful, in, in a civil sense, um, racial vilification. And racial vilification um, is defined as, um, I won't read it, but uh, an act that is reasonably likely to offend, insult, humiliate or intim intimidate another person or group of people. And the act is done because of the race, colour or national or ethnic origin of the other person or some or all of that of that people. Now there are, there are, in the paper you will see that position and there are extensions so that, for example, if, um, if uh, you say, make some comment that is generally attributable to, to some people um, uh, by, by uh, myth, uh, that will nevertheless be uh, racial uh, vilification. There is a defence to it and the defence is uh, essentially one which attempts to allow freedom of speech in bona fide and genuine circumstances. And that defence is um, where what is done is in the performance is done in good faith and in the performance or exhibition or distribution of an artistic work um, in the course of a academic, uh, artistic, scientific or political discussion um, that is genuinely in the public interest um, or the making or publishing of a fair and accurate report of something that is occurring in the public interest. So that the freedom of speech aspects are provided as a defence to the racial vilification provisions. Now, as a Jewish community, we were faced with a number of dilemmas. The first of them is uh, it started with a, a small um, aspect of um, Holocaust denial and racial vilification in the state of Tasmania, our smallest state, in which there are literally a handful of Jewish uh, members who had neither the resources nor the capacity to deal with it. The Executive Council of Australian Jury, uh, to which I am still a consultant, um, decided to take this case. It's a case called Scully. Um, she was uh, of Lithuanian uh, origin. And um, uh, we took the case. The first issue was what is the standing of the Executive Council of Australian Jury to take such a case? Are we a group that can be vilified? And are we, do we have the interest to stop other people from publishing such material? 
um, in a, a, a land make, this was all test, these were all test cases and therefore it took a huge amount of time to which I will also come if I have the time. And, um, and uh, we took that case, a case called the Executive Council of Australian Jury and Scully in the federal court and were found to have the requisite interest to stop racial vilification of Jews and to uh, continue the, the proceedings. As a matter of technicality, it was ended up being continued in the name of the then Vice President of the Council, who later became President, um, Jeremy Jones. So ultimately, the case was decided, and it was decided in favour of the Jewish community. It's a case called Jones and Scully, a reference to which is, will be found in the, in the paper. The, that, that uh, dare I say, with great respect to the judge, excellent judgment um, the, uh, uh, of Justice Healy lay down a number of principles which ultimately we followed in later cases. The first of them was Holocaust denial is racial vilification. It intimidates, harasses and insults Jewish people. It necessarily involves the imputation that the Jewish community is fraudulently pursuing an issue as to the as to the nature of the Holocaust and its, and its impact. The second aspect was that um, the courts could force persons to with either cease the conduct uh, and or withdraw the, the comments that had already been made. That case was ultimately then developed. It took a long time, uh, mainly because of the intricacies of Australian laws that then existed and which have since been amended at our behest. But the, the, um, that case was then progressed. I should say that Frederick Tobin came to the assistance of Ms Scully in the running of her case. Um, and Frederick Tobin was the next target. Unlike the Argentinian and French examples of which we have heard, we chose at that stage to target the author of the, of the material, not the service provider. And that again is a matter to which I will come shortly. The, um, as I said to you, I'm not going to deal with the kind of uh, material that was there. You've heard it from Eliha Cohen. Uh, much of the material that was shown by Eli in the first session and which he said is no longer on the net is not on the net because we won the Tobin case. Um, in fact, in that case, the judge ordered that um, the material that was on the net um, be withdrawn from the net and not republished or anything of a similar vein. Frederick Tobin um, refused to abide by the order. There was an appeal. We won the appeal. The appeal itself stands as the authority been binding um, issue on Holocaust denial being um, racial vilification, on the Jews being an ethnic group, on the issue of the standing and the capacity to, to uh, deal with the net and its publication on the net. Um, he refused to abide by the order even after the appeal. We prosecuted for contempt. He was found guilty of contempt as a consequence of which Frederick Tobin was sentenced to three months in jail for the contempt of court in refusing to deal as he did. Now, um, the cases are available. The reference of, to them is in the, in the papers and I don't need to deal with them probably beyond that which I've already said from the sort of group analysis of it about which we are now talking. Can I deal, though, with some issues? One of them was the extraterritoriality issue uh, about which there were some questions at the end of the last session. Some of the material Frederick Tobin produced was, in fact, republished from material that, was, that emanated from the United States. The High Court in Australia has not dealt with it by way of extraterritoriality. On the contrary, in a case also involving a member of the Jewish community, in, coincidentally, in, called Gutnick and Dow Jones, the High Court laid down that every time a person accesses the internet, there is a publication. So that it is not the placement of the uh, offending material on the internet uh, that will give rise to the jurisdiction of the Australian courts. It's, it's the capacity of an Australian and the fact that an Australian has accessed the material in Australia. And every time that occurs, there is a publication in Australia, and every time that occurs, um, proceedings can be taken in Australia. So that there is no issue in Australian law, uh, as it currently stands, 
um, and is laid down by the High Court, that if material is published from the um, um, International Historical Review um, or Dew Watch or whatever it happens to be, uh, and is available in Australia, it can be the subject of, of, um, of um, proceedings. Now, I have, um, for reasons of time and, and other matters, um, elided issues such as criminal and civil issues. There are criminal sanctions for racial vilification and hate, and hate speech in Australia. They are state laws. There, are, there have been very few um, uh, prosecutions for, um, um, for racial vilification. There have been some, but very few. We chose not to take that course. We chose to use the federal law, which is a civil law, and a penalty applies, and damages apply, although we didn't actually seek damages, uh, but we sought restrictive orders such as injunctions and the like. The, the, um, the process that we went through, we did deliberately because we took a number of things that were important to us. Firstly, we did not want to give a platform to the Holocaust deniers for them to spew forth their material in court in circumstances where it would be privileged. Secondly, we did not want to embark upon a process which could be seen as, quote, proving the truth of the Holocaust. That was beyond the question of legitimate um, uh, curial proceedings. And thirdly, we did not want to embark upon a process in which we may ultimately lose because of the uh, obvious difficulties with burden of proof in criminal proceedings. So for all of those reasons, we chose the civil path and we chose a path which ultimately was successful. Now, success has to be measured in, in a variety of ways. It took an enormous amount of resources, all of it uh, provided um, free of charge by members of the Jewish community, but resources nevertheless that were otherwise um, wasted on work that could have been productive. It also took in a huge amount of time. The law is the back end of an axe when we're dealing with Holocaust denial. It is a useful tool, but it is no more than a useful tool. It is a useful tool for the purposes of declaring that which is unlawful and setting proper standards for communal behaviour, but it is not a tool that can be used to deny the existence or to, or to stop the promulgation of Holocaust denial in and of itself. Having won all of the cases and sent Mr Tobin somewhat later to jail, um, unfortunately for not long enough, um, the, the, um, the issue arose as to what we then do. Now, internet service providers in Australia are protected by legislation. Schedule 5 of the Broadcasting Services Act 1992 is a Commonwealth legislation. Again, there's a reference to it in the paper, and it uh, renders internet service providers uh, free from liability if they are unaware of the content of the material on their website. What we then did was use the regulator, that is the person who licenses uh, radio and ISP licenses in Australia, um, to utilise the declarations that are made as to what is unlawful to then attack the ISPs and get them to enforce their own code of conduct and that is a process which is continuing. So that we have used the law against racial vilification to declare that which is unlawful and then use that as a means of um, enforcing it against um, internet service providers at least insofar as they are publishing in Australia. But there are problems with legal cases, evidentiary problems. To prove that which is on the internet is not easy. Um, you can capture it uh, and you can prove that it was captured at X point in time, the next day it is something different. Um, to prove the authorship of something which is on the internet is almost impossible. Certainly I would have thought wearing my criminal law hat, almost impossible by criminal law standards. And the third thing is that it is so easy to alter the authorship or the publisher of the material. So Frederick Tobin uh, can be publishing on Monday and his mate from Melbourne can be publishing on Tuesday. And an order that prohibits Frederick Tobin from publishing will not affect um, the person who is publishing in Melbourne. That is why we have to use and we thought in Australia that we had to use the de declaration of unlawfulness of the material to impact the ISPs um, 
uh, directly and prevent them from publishing that material or material of that kind. The, um, the last matter is that um, there is um, necessarily involved in the legislation of Australia an, an argument about bona fides uh, because uh, people like Tobin dress up their vile material in a way that purports to make it look scientific, uh, you know, no holes, no holocaust, um, that, that sort of stuff. Um, there is always that sort of argument. Thankfully in Australia, uh, most of the judges have more sense than to, to, to accept that proposition. But um, I want to come back to, to uh, two or three aspects and then um, the lessons that, um, that I say we should draw and that we have drawn as a community from these issues. The first is that in the course of um, dealing with these aspects, we underestimate <coughs> the effect of the, of the um, communications revolution. Um, bodies that previously held power and persuasion because they possessed information and could promulgate it to the citizenship no longer have that power because people can obtain information from sources independent of those with authority. And what we also underestimate is that we are in a period of postmodernism. Every view is a view, according to some, that is worth hearing. It is the reason we hear that terrorists are militants and that um, Holocaust denial finds its way onto the net. The, s the values that are affected by that information are not um, issues that determine whether that information will find its way onto the net or that people read it or don't read it. Now, as a, as a criminal law in, in issues of treason or terrorism trials or, or indeed uh, murder trials, we say to a jury, do not look at the internet for information. I use the example, if you looked up my name on the internet, you would find I was a member of the House of Representatives in Washington. Um, what is on the internet is not necessarily true. And when you're dealing with 12 people, well, you can do that. But when you're dealing with a whole society, when you're dealing with 2 billion people, it is impossible. So we should not underestimate the effect of the technological revolution. The enemies of the Jewish people and Israel understand that proposition and they understand it in a way that we have yet to realise. It is the reason that, in my view, um, we have Ahmadinejad spewing forth um, Holocaust denial because it delegitimises the Jewish people and the story of the Jewish people and it delegitimises, in his view, the creation of the State of Israel. Some years ago, 2002, I gave a paper dealing in the community with how we commemorate the Shoah. And I made the point in that and I reiterate it here, that the commemoration of the Shoah is not the creation of the State of Israel. Six million died in, in the Shoah, four and a half million of them were adults. Even if only 50% of them were Zionists, we are talking about two and a quarter million more Zionists that ultimately would have found their way into Israel and which would have made Israel that much stronger. To, den to, to base the creation of the State of Israel on the Holocaust does two things. It gives a weapon to people like Ahmadinejad. It de-Middle Easts the basis of the creation of the State of Israel and delegitimizes the Jewish people in their right to self-determination and a right to their ancient homeland. The second aspect is um, that the Jewish community must learn from its mistakes in the past. We cannot allow any of the governments in the countries from which we emanate to support this issue, that is the issues against the State of Israel and its delegitimization, and we cannot um, allow to go unanswered the issues of Holocaust denial for the same reasons. We have been lucky, I don't know that luck is all that much to do with it, but we have been lucky in Australia because we have extremely strong bipartisan support from the two major parties, 
in a way that, in my view, would probably be stronger support for Israel now than is the United States government. Can I come back to the lessons that need to be learnt and which we may utilise? Firstly, law is a tool, albeit a necessary tool, not a panacea. It is not a cure or an antidote to Holocaust denial. Secondly, education, of which we have uh, taken enormous steps, and uh, you heard from uh, the speaker last night that Australia now sponsors non-Jewish school teachers to Yad Vashem um, and brings out Yad Vashem people to lecture at the Sydney Jewish Museum and through the Board of Jewish Education. We have made Holocaust education a compulsory part of the national curriculum in Australia, and uh, we anticipate that it will remain so. The third aspect is the issue of political agitation with which I've dealt. And the fourth uh, is the fact that even though we targeted the author, it is ultimately necessary by whatever legal means are appropriate in the various countries from which you come to target the, the, um, the ISPs and the carriers of the information. Um, and that can be targeted both from laws such as racial vilification as is done in Australia or Holocaust denial as it's done in most parts of Europe, or it can be done in some instances, for example in Google, um, perhaps by issues such as misleading and deceptive um, conduct. So when you're dealing with a Google which is a search engine and doesn't itself, or may not itself convey the, they convey the material, it may nevertheless be advising or representing that material on the Holocaust is contained, uh, material on the slaughter of Jews is contained in material that in fact denies the slaughter of Jews. And that may ultimately be an avenue that is available to us. Ultimately, uh, what is necessary is vigilance. Um, I applaud the, the uh, association for conducting this session on this issue. I am greatly honoured that I've been asked to speak on it and um, I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you.